What is up, everybody, and welcome back to the undefeated post weigh in show for UFC Vegas 89. I am so pumped up for this card. We talked about it being a fresh dumpster to dive in. I talked on Monday about how I didn't like all of these lines, and the longer the week goes, the more and more I find myself going, huh, huh, I like that. Mm, maybe I'll add that. I'm going to have way too much money on this really low level fight card by tomorrow. It's not going to be a good deal. What's up, everybody? Hit the like button for me. If you're new here, what we do on the Undefeated Post Weigh-In Show, we've already talked about these fights. We talked totals yesterday on the Total Takedown. We broke these all down on Monday with a guest and talked about everything we knew. We take all that info, we talk to all the boys in the group chats and the DMs, and then we take every little bit of information we've got combined with watching these fighters get on the scale and seeing them face off with each other. We put all that into our cauldron and we mix it around and we give you the last opinion before these fights tomorrow and hopefully a little bit of information that will help you make a good bet and of course we are undefeated never a bad bet never a bad read given out on this particular show best damn betting show on the internet today let's freaking go first fight of the night we've got mick parkin taking on muhammad uzman parkin came in at 262 and a half uzman came in at 263 sorry 237. I don't know how I got 263 out of that. I have no idea what I'm talking about. Mick Parkin gave the one-arm flex. No issues. He's a classic big old flabby boy. Mohamed Uzman, intense as ever. He did give a big old flex up there. The guy is very physically intimidating. When they face off, Parkin has a decent size advantage. He is a real heavyweight up there, and he's a decent bit larger than Uzman is. Now, Uzman was mean mugging him the entire freaking time. How do you not love Mick Parkin? He tries to like, you know, some fighters will let go of the mean mug after the stare down's over and they'll smile and shake hands and be respectful. Mick pulled that move and Usman just like went straight back to mean mugging him when he tried to touch him. It was pretty funny. Um, I've been leaning towards Mick Parkin all week. Some very sharp people that I respect are on the Usman side of things here in this one. And I get it. You know, big sloppy heavyweight fight could be close. Could, uh, could be hairy, could be lots of cage clinching, and I think that makes sense. So a lot of people are dog or pass, but after seeing the size advantage that Mick has in this spot, I've never been high on Usman. In fact, I think he's going to flare out sooner than later in the UFC. I don't think he's got the skill set. Yes, he's strong. It looks like his cardio is getting a little bit better. He can beat some low-level competition. However, I think Mick probably has a much higher ceiling than Usman does. I'm going to go ahead and lock in and say Mick Parkin is the side here in this spot for me. Um, I don't know that I'm necessarily going to bet it, Right now, Mick Parkin is minus 148 is the best number I think that I can see out there. And I do like that it's a short price. So if you pick your side here, you're getting a little plus money or you're not laying a ton of chalk. It's a good spot to get involved in if you feel like betting. I could see this fight going under. Usman does have knockout power. Mick Parkin has basically a better well-rounded skill set. The thing that I'm going to go ahead and just... Uh, hit you with the tinfoil cap for here on this one, is I actually kind of like Mick Parkin by submission, believe it or not. I've been looking over this. Muhammad Usman has two losses on his record, one by decision and then one by sub. And that's the one where he just kind of gave up. He just kind of folded. He gave his opponent what they wanted after he got tired out. We know Mick Parkin can wrestle. We know Muhammad Usman wants to wrestle. So these guys are going to get in there and they're going to lean up against each other. We're in the small cage. And I think the technical ability of Mick Parkin combined with the fact that he's just the bigger man in there and he weighs much more i think that's gonna wear uzman out now mick can go for tko he's got way more knockout finishes on his record than he does submission finishes but when you've got a guy that's looking for the door when you've got a guy who's ready to quit when you've got a guy that's like god i'm tired i just want to get out of here they tend to give up their neck. They tend to, you know, make a mistake. They slip up. They get caught. And Usman is a guy who's got a pretty dang good chin. He's durable. We've seen that. I think Mick Parkin can grab a neck at some point. And at plus 800, that might be the move. I may end up actually adding a little bit of Mick Parkin here to my card because of that. Next up, you've got Andre Lima taking on Igor Severino. We've got 126 for Lima, 125 for uh, Silva Severino, which, you know, it's listed on the UFC site and it books it at different names and stuff like that, but it's the same guy. Um, Lima was extremely amped up, screaming. His cheeks were on full display. This guy was sucked out for the weight cut. No real problems or anything like that, though. Um, Igor went up there and gave himself a little chest pound. He was pretty calm comparatively. This is a good face-off. Both guys really intense. I like Lima's hat. Um, both guys are ready to go. This is going to be a fun fight. I think this one should be a bit of a barn burner. You've got one guy that's got, like, a slight perceived edge 
average as far as their ability and skills go. And then you've got the other guy who's got the edge and intensity and, uh, you know, forward pressure. It's going to be fun to watch. I picked Lima on Monday. He was minus 180 then. He's minus 180 now. This line has not moved. I'm still picking Andre Lima to be the one to go ahead and win this fight, but it's mostly note-taking for me. I don't know enough about either of these guys, and especially with both of them coming off the Contender Series, we're not sure which or either of them is even UFC caliber at this point, so I'm just going to be watching and taking notes. This is not a fight that I'm targeting for betting purposes. Next up, Monserrat Rendon takes on Daira Jaleznikova, and that's how you say that, ladies and gentlemen. I paid attention. Da Jaleznikova, and uh, Rendon came in at 135. Jaleznikova, 135 and a half. Rendon, big smile, no problem. She looked real fun up there. Um, Daira came in and actually looked pretty good. She looked a little... Uh, you know, when when you get a new UFC fighter, they, they tend to not know what to do with their hands on the scale, right? Ron Burgundy style. Or, Ron Burgundy, what is wrong with me? I am mixing up my movie references, Ron Burgundy. <sighs> wrong Will Ferrell movie. My bad, people. I'm better than that. Um, Daira is much larger than Rendon. And that is something, to me, folks, that just jumps, like, right off the cage. First and foremost, Dyra's the prospect here. The UFC wants Dyra to win this fight. Rendon was brought in to be cannon fodder. She's old. She's not very experienced. She's not very good. She's big. She's strong. Those are basically the only things that she has going for her. And I thought this was going to be a test where can Dyra overcome the physicality of Rendon. Dyra's bigger. Dyra's the bigger fighter in there. She's absolutely the side. Now, do I want to lay minus 225 on a women's MMA debutante in this spot? Not really. Probably not. But she really is being put in a position to win this fight. There's not a whole lot of threat that's coming back at her from Rendon. I think she's going to knock her out. I know that sounds crazy, but I think I think Zeleznikova is going to knock her out because the speed advantage is going to be ridiculous. And I don't think it's going to be a spot where, uh, don't get me wrong, she could grab a neck, right? At any point in time, if you're in a spot where you could finish, you could tap somebody instead of knocking them out. But the way Dyra fights, it's her ground and pound. She's so nasty. If she stuffs the hips, if she gets on top when Montserrat Rendon is hurt and diving in for a takedown or something like that, Again, she could grab a neck if she so chooses, but I think she's going to go to work with elbows. I think she's just going to get on top of her and pound. She doesn't have a single submission on her record, and even though Montserrat Rendon is someone who's never been finished before, I think this is the spot where it happens. She's going to get clipped. Speed kills. Speed really kills, and that's the problem here in this spot is that when you've got that speed advantage, there's not a whole lot you can do about it. So I actually think Zeleznikova might end up getting this win here in impressive fashion. Next up, you've got Jarno Ahrens taking on Steven Wynn. Uh, Ahrens won 145, I'm sorry, 144 and a half. Win came in at 145. Aaron's looked good. No real issues on the scales today. I was impressed by his weigh in. Steve Wynn, very blank face. He almost has the Chama face where it's, he's got a giant jaw on him and he's just kind of staring off into the distance. No emotion. He looked good though. He looked good. Um, when they face off, Aaron's has a decent size advantage here in this spot. He was kind of pushing his way in. It was funny. They were both doing kind of the Diaz elbow thing. And as they got close to each other, um, Win blocked Aaron's with his own elbows. So they were like touching arms and Win wouldn't let Aaron's get any closer to him. And it's funny because I think that's indicative of how this fight is going to go. Win is going to want to keep Aaron's away from him and just kind of keep him on the edge of his punches and volume him out of there. Aaron's is going to want to crash the pocket and hurt this man. And that's the only way he wins this fight. And I talked on Monday about how I felt like Steven Wynn was the side just because I wasn't impressed with what Aaron did in his last fight. But as I kind of went back, I'm like, you know what? Like, I'm not impressed with Steven Wynn at all. I don't know if he's going to be able to keep the distance here from Aaron's. He was given an absolute can his last time on Dana White's Contender Series, and he got a mercy stoppage there. He wasn't hitting that guy hard enough to back him off. And because of that, I don't think he's going to hit hard enough to keep Jarno Aaron's off of him. I'm completely 180 flipping here, folks. I thought Steve Wynn was going to be the side. I was nowhere near that money line. I said it was dog or pass from a betting perspective. And now I think it's dog or pass, period. In fact, I think the dog might outright win. Um, one thing that is helping with this, by the way. Now, it's funny. You guys only get me on this show. So I kind of bottle all my thoughts together for you and just kind of give everything to you at once. I had decided that I was on the Aaron side already, and then a little ping popped up on my uh, on my desktop. I got news from our boy Andrew from Superbook Sports. The big guy himself has made his presence known in this fight, and he took Jarno Aaron's. So not only did I go kind of, you know, bing, I woke up. Hey, I kind of like the Aaron side in this spot more than I did on Monday. Now the big guy is involved with a bet 
on Jarno Aarons. Do with that information what you will, but Aarons is probably going to end up on my betting card in some capacity because of the combination of those two factors. The fact that I kind of have decided I like that side myself anyway, and the fact that the big guy is involved, I'm probably going to hop in. Cody Gibson and Miles Johns up next. Gibson comes in at 135 and a half. Miles Johns 136. Cody Gibson is absolutely shredded. I mean, holy shit. Like, this guy is so sucked out. He is big for this weight class, and he's got a a ton of muscle on his frame. I don't know how he's making 135. I really don't. It doesn't look healthy. Miles Johns gave a big flex up there, though. No issues. We know he struggled with this weight cut a little bit, but he's shorter. He's a little thicker, so it, it's okay. He's all right. Um, when they face off, though, Gibson's so much larger than Miles Johns. Big size advantage there. This was a really great stare down, and this is another spot similar to, you know, the last one that I was talking about. I kind of talked myself into the Miles Johns side on Monday, right? I talked about some of the weaknesses I see in Cody Gibson, some of the mistakes that he makes. But I've never been a Miles Johns guy. I've never been on that side. In fact, I always try to fade him. I always try to be on the other side of him. I feel like he's overrated. I don't like his cardio. We talked about the PED situation. There's a big question mark around that right now. Cody Gibson is far more physical and far more, uh, you know, menacing and imposing, much larger. I think that's going to wear in this fight. We're in the small cage. Miles Johns won't be able to finesse as much. And I've seen Cody Gibson can go a hard 15 minutes. I already have questions about whether or not Miles Johns can do that. This is another one that I'm flipping on. Now, more so than the side, I'm picking Cody Gibson to win now. I don't know if I'm going to bet him on a money line, though. I might actually bet violence because all the things I said on Monday that I liked about Miles Johns, those are all still true. And now kind of respecting what Cody Gibson might be able to get out there and do in this fight, I think that sets up very nicely for violence. The under two and a half is plus 145. Fight doesn't go the distance is plus 120. I think we could see a finish here. You know, Miles Johns has finished a bunch of people in there and... and what Cody Gibson does plays right into the hands of how Miles Johns likes to finish. And then on top of that, I feel like Gibson is going to just kind of keep crashing into Miles Johns until one of them gasses out or breaks. And because of that, I think we get a violent fight. So I kind of like that under. I might end up adding some violence here on this one. Juicy J, Julian Arosa comes on here, taking on Ricardo Ramos. Arosa 146, Ramos 145 and a half. No issues for uh, Julian Arosa, really. He looked good up there. He's taken a little bit of time off, which I think suited him. He made the weight cut. No issues. Hamos always has kind of a sunken in eye look. I actually have that myself. If you can't tell, you can see the bags right there. That's just natural. That's genetics. I don't know what to do about it. Um, Ricardo Hamos has kind of the same thing, I think. And this, they called him Billy Q on the uh, on the broadcast. It was pretty funny. After he weighed in, they called him Billy Q and had to correct that. Um, Arosa does have a height advantage here in this spot. This was a very friendly face-off. These guys respect each other, and they size up pretty well given there's that little height advantage. It's not a really big one or anything. Um, I'm picking Ricardo Hamos in this spot, but I feel like these are both very untrustworthy fighters. You know, I know Hamos has the ability to finish uh, Julian Arosa. You could touch him on the chin at any point in time, but we've seen Hamos just kind of make mistakes and collapse in on himself. And given that, Arosa's not the guy you want to do that against. He's got nasty submission upside. He's got big power. He's got lots of skills. He's probably better everywhere outside of like maybe the wrestling or pure jiu-jitsu. So I think Julian is going to have opportunities to finish Ricardo Hamos, Hamos can out wrestle Erosa, and I think Hamos can knock out Erosa. I do think this fight is another violent one. Under two and a half is minus 180, though, so I don't really want to eat that kind of chalk on an under. I expect one of these guys at some point slips up and probably gets finished. I'm just not sure who. I know a lot of people are jumping in on Julian Erosa, and I've always been kind of a fade Erosa type of guy because usually you get numbers doing it. And uh, now the uh, the shine has kind of come off with back-to-back -back finishes. I could see Hamos by KO, but it's only plus 250. It's not really giving me enough juice to get in there. Um, the good one that you want to kind of probably sprinkle on just a little bit is that Juicy J sub round three after everybody's tired and slippery and uh, looks like it's going to go the distance, but not quite. 22 to one. Maybe we get a sprinkle there on that one. I don't think I'm going to be very invested in this fight. I'm going to go ahead and pick Ricardo Hamos as the younger fighter with probably the higher ceiling to go ahead and get the win that he's supposed to get. Uh, but I could see Julian Arosa beating him in several different ways. Kurt Hollibaugh takes on Trey Ogden up next. Both guys came in at 155 and a half pounds. Um, Kurt Hollibaugh looked great. Big flex. Looks fantastic on the scale today. Trey Ogden, though, great shape. He looks fantastic. He looked like he put some serious work into this camp, and he was very, very blank and emotionless up there today. Ogden is absolutely jacked. I mean, I can't understate that. His physical nature, this fight specifically, looks like it's a little enhanced compared to what we have seen before. Slight height advantage for Kurt, nothing crazy. 
I like the uh, Ogden side. I've always kind of been a, a low-key Ogden guy, right? We've gone to war with them a couple times. We got robbed last time with the early stoppage, no contest bullshit. I worry about that kind of influencing the line a little bit because I think some people may overrate Ogden now compared to what he's been in the past. I do think he's the more technical fighter. I know he's got a grappling advantage, a wrestling advantage over Kurt Hollibaugh. I know Kurt's been working on that, so I'm not sure how that's going to play out. And then on the feet, even though I think Kurt probably is the more dynamic striker, I, I like the way Trey Ogden thinks. I like how uh, mentally strong that he is, and I like his game planning. I, I think he can work around a jab setup and baby, uh, basically keep Kurt Hollibaugh off of him for these uh, this fight here. I think this one's going over. I think Ogden by decision is probably the best way to look, plus 140. I don't know that he's going to have an opportunity to finish a guy like this, but you never know. It's it's fights, right? Like Anybody could get binked on the button at any point in time. I'm still picking Trey Ogden. Some money has come in on Holiba, dropping that number a little bit, and uh, I don't know. Uh, like I mentioned before, I've got a lot invested on this card already, so do I need to lay minus 150 with Trey Ogden to find out? I'm not sure I do. So I might end up passing on this one, but I'm definitely picking Trey Ogden to win the fight by decision and that's plus 140 so you know if you want to flip that number up a little bit and, and go for the most likely outcome where you're getting plus money on it don't mind it Fernando Padilla takes on uh Luis Puello in this fight 145 for each of these men Padilla was all smiles today he looked great very confident he moonwalked off the stage impressive by the way I've got two left feet I can't do that shit uh Luis went up there looking good he looked a, a bit deer in the headlights at first he looked like he was a little worried about his weight they called it he's good he's all right no problems um Padilla came out looking like the pirate king he's wearing the hat like he's he's all good to go my guy likes him some anime and you look at his uh you look at his Instagram page and he's like matching the pose and all that kind of stuff. You guys know I'm a nerd. You you know I dig that kind of thing. So I'm into it. Uh, big height advantage here for Padilla. I locked a bet in on him earlier. I've got 3.2 units to win two units, I believe, on this one. And uh, I just like him in this spot. I feel like he kind of underperformed in his last fight and he'll get back on track here in this one. I know Luis is someone you can't really look past, but he's also kind of the perfect opponent here for Padilla. He's going to crash forward and he doesn't have great defense. I feel like the punching accuracy and speed of Fernando Padilla is going to be kind of what shows here in this spot and uh, unless he breaks or gets out cardioed those are kind of Louis's path to victory here is he's going to have to keep on coming until Padilla can't really do it anymore and then pace him late down the fight or hurt him with something big I like Padilla I think he gets a knockout I think Louis kind of presents it to him and he probably gets it early so I'm, I'm taking Padilla by KO Billy Q takes on Yusef Zalal up next. Billy Q, classic skinny, shredded, 145 and a half pounds, 146 for Zalal. No issues for him. He looked filled out really well, actually. And a lot of people are questioning, sending me messages. Um, you know, it's Ramadan, right? Like Zalal's fighting during Ramadan. What's going on with that? I did the work for you. I listened to an interview and he talked about how he actually is going to essentially celebrate Ramadan late. Like this is too big of a life opportunity for him, too big of a career opportunity for him. He couldn't pass it up. So he's not going to say no to this. And he's also not going to put himself in a bad position, starving himself during fight week for a fight during Ramadan. He's basically just going to go, hey, I'm going to do Ramadan by myself and, and celebrate it after the fight is over. So he's eating right. He's coming in healthy. He's not, he is rolling off the couch, but he's one of those guys that's been waiting for his UFC opportunity, training a lot, very active on the regional scene. So he's been waiting for this opportunity to come back. I actually bet Yusef Zalal earlier in the week, and this line movement is crazy, folks. Um, Zalal's your favorite now. This is wild. Like, Billy Q opened up a decent favorite. I thought we were going to get plus 160 on Yusef Zalal because Billy Q is just the absolute fan favorite here everybody on twitter like billy q is a great guy he seems like a lot of fun i get it i'm a fan of his myself um so i thought we were going to get a wider line instead what's happened is this line has crashed and it's crashed hard zalal is now the favorite at minus 115 billy q the underdog at minus 105 never saw that coming i'm glad i jumped in when i did because if i didn't i wouldn't really want to lay the chalk on zalal i want to be on the plus money side of this fight so i am picking zalal to go ahead and win this one i think billy q's takedown defense is going to be a bit of a problem and I'm worried about his durability. Now, Zalal is not the biggest power puncher in the world. I got kind of made fun of my guy Danny from the club and sub gave me shit for talking about Billy Q's durability. Um, but it, the fact of the matter is, if the durability goes, like, anybody can get you. You know what I mean? So I don't necessarily know that Billy Q is going to get knocked out by Yous Yousef Zalal in this fight. But it could happen. You have to factor in the fact that there is that chance, right? So it doesn't hurt my side for him to be a little bit chinny. Um, so yeah, I, I'm in on Zalal. I'm in on Zalal early in the week at plus money. That's long gone. Do with that what you guys will. I mean, it's a coin flip now. So make your decision. And I'm sorry if you can't tell me at plus money at this point, because I was not expecting the number to move the way that it has on this fight so aggressively. Next up, you've got Cameron Simon 
Peyton Talbot, Twitter, Civil War of the Week. Maybe Billy Q Zalal is actually at this point. These are the two fights that nobody can really agree on. Cameron Simon, 135. Peyton Talbot, 135 and a half. Simon, no problem on the scales today. Very relaxed, look good, no issues. Peyton Talbot, same thing, no problem. He actually was having some fun up there. He was like Arnold flexing and showing off his newfound back muscles and stuff. He looked great. These guys size up really well. Peyton Talbot looks like he is slightly larger. Um, Peyton Talbot was talking. He was saying something, and I was trying to, like, listen. And re- if you guys could figure out what Peyton Talbot said at that face-off, like, jump in the comments and let me know, because I-, I need to know what he was saying. It was interesting, because I do feel like this is a spot where uh, Peyton Talbot's all aura here, man. Like, there- there's something about this kid. I've talked to you guys about him. I think he's special. I really think he's something else. And he feels that. He's up in there. And Cameron Simon, even though he's got that quiet confidence, which I usually like, and and he's the one with the experience at the UFC level, like Peyton Talbot's the guy that comes in and he's staring daggers through this guy's soul. Like you could just see it at the face off that, I don't know. Again, something about Talbot. It speaks to me. This is my max bet, guys. I got in at minus 110. That number's gone. I tweeted it out. If you wanted to be on the side with me, I hope you got in when you did. 7.7 7.7 units to win seven on Peyton Talbot, my second best bet of the year. Seven units is my max. And uh, I did kind of break that rule just a little bit to get to 7.7 to win seven because I didn't want to win like 6.4 or whatever. I wanted to win a full seven. Um, so we went a little above it on that number. Um, I like Peyton Talbot a lot. And honestly, I think he's going to finish Cameron Simon. I think this fight's going to go late. And I think as uh, Cameron Simon kind of accumulates damage here Peyton Talbot's eventually going to clip him with something big because he just kind of amps the volume up the deeper the fight goes I think he's going to TKO him in the third round either that or he's going to clearly win rounds two and three the way Christian Rodriguez did and I think that's kind of a game plan that can be used against Cameron Simon in fact I think UFC sees that Talbot cranks it up in a similar way and that's worked before and that's why this fight is being booked it's kind of a sink or swim for Cameron Simon you just faced this you lost to it now try again or hey we've got a star in Peyton Talbot UFC can't lose this fight like whichever one of these guys wins in uh, you know big time fashion they're going to be looking good moving forward the UFC has a prospect but I'm on the Peyton Talbot side next up you've got AJ Dobson and Edmund Shabazian Dobson 185 and a half Shabazian 186 AJ Dobson looks very filled out up there looked relaxed no problem Edmund Shabazian did look a little bit rough he gave a very solid flex dude's got a big frame this is a bit of a tough weight cut for him he's okay though he was all smiley afterwards Edmund does have a size advantage this was a good stare down between these guys Um, very respectful very fun natured kind of like I was talking about before right as soon as the the mean part's over they can have fun and shake hands um i'm picking edmund shabazian in this fight and a slightly hot take is edmund shabazian by decision it's like plus 300 i know a lot of people are trying to fade him and i just don't think this is the spot um aj dobson to me is the kind of guy that kind of plays perfectly into the hand of edmund shabazian edmund's bigger edmund's stronger Edmund is the better striker, and so when these guys go to war, Edmund's going to win all those exchanges. Now, then it comes down to cardio. AJ Dobson is not a guy that pushes a relentless pace. AJ Dobson does have some grappling, but he struggled with those takedowns at the UFC level. So is he going to just kind of flatten out Edmund Shabazian and take him down and wash him whenever, wherever he wants to? No, I don't think he's going to. So in those grappling transitions, Edmund might actually win a couple of those in this fight for the first time in his UFC career. And if he does that, he'll have an opportunity to catch his breath. And if he can catch his breath then he can extend the fight so he's been finished in like round late round two early round three by guys much higher level than this this is a breaking competition i i think the ufc is kind of giving him that here you go kid it's a softball get back on track do what you need to do and i think edmund's gonna play this one relatively safe i think edmund by decision at plus 300 is a little hot takey but i think it makes sense in this spot now i wouldn't hate a sprinkle on edmund by sub and i know that sounds crazy because he's the knockout guy but he's been working so relentlessly hard on his grappling that I wouldn't be surprised at all if he wins those wrestling exchanges or grabs a neck we've seen him jump gilly before like that's the kind of thing that I think he might actually be able to snag at some point it's plus 800 which feels short for a guy that hasn't subbed anybody in the UFC so I think that might be a little bit of a interesting look as well I'm probably laying off of it Edmund's the type of guy you don't want to trust at minus 200 chalk but I really think this fight is built for him um, next fight up, you've got Justin Toffa and Carl Williams, co-main event, 264 and a half for Justin Toffa. No real issues for him. Um, same thing with Carl Williams, 246, however, 20 pounds lighter. 
Um, one arm flex, no problems. He looks like a guy that probably could make 205 if he really wanted to. Williams has a slight height advantage here, but it's really not a lot. These are a couple short squat tanky type of dudes. And again, I don't trust either of these guys. I got to pick Carl Williams, the wrestling, the grappling. I think that'll make a difference. I think he'll be able to take Toffa down. Toffa may never get back up. That's entirely possible, but I am going to look at live betting on this one. I'll be watching closely because if Carl Williams can't get the finish on Toffa, we've seen him gas. We've seen him slow down. He's small at heavyweight. And if Toffa has done any type of improvement whatsoever in his grappling or his ground game or his get up game, if this fight gets extended, he's got that death punch. Like he'll just touch you and you'll fall over. And Chase Sherman was getting to Carl Williams. If Chase Sherman can get to you, Toffa can get to you. And so I think Justin Toffa stands a very good chance of knocking out Carl William if this fight gets extended. So I'm going to be looking very closely at that. I don't want plus 160 preflop. I want to see him lose round one. Give me plus 300, plus 350, something like that going into round two and then just nuke the guy. <laughs> That's what I'll be looking for. Uh, main event time, Amanda Hivas takes on Rose Namajunas. Both ladies make 125 and a half pounds. Very classic uh, Hiva smile after making weight. Of course, she's adorable up there every single time, having fun. Rose Nami Yunus, oddly emotional, looked almost like she was going to cry after she made weight. That's strange. It's not something I want to necessarily see with a fighter that I'm backing. I already talked about how Rose can be a little bit of a head case. I know she's gotten into her faith a lot lately, and we've talked about how that can be a double-edged sword. Some people that actually helps, you know, kind of set them free and motivate them and release them. And then you've got guys like uh, the Red King who went over to Bellator and after he found God, became a completely passive person and couldn't find a finish against anybody because he didn't want to hurt anybody anymore. And it just takes the fight right out of you. So I'm a little worried about that, but that's something she's been doing for, for a decent amount of time in her career. It's not like that's a brand new thing, uh, but the emotion on the scale does worry me just a, just a tidbit here. Reboss is just ever so slightly taller. It's not by a lot. It's not a huge difference. Um, Rose, different level in my opinion. You know, she's had gold wrapped around her waist. She's fought with some of the best in the world and she's come through on the other side of it fine. Amanda Hibas has never been able to break through and every time she gets close, she gets knocked out. So not only does she not pass those tests, but she gets finished. And now we're up at 125 where Rose has talked about adding some size, adding some muscle and trusting her hands more, hitting harder because of the extra size on her and she's comfortable now at 125. I took Rose inside the distance. I got plus 120, two units on that. Uh, I don't mind Rose as like an anchor point if you're doing parlays and stuff like that it's an easy hedge on Hibas on the other side of this thing I just think Rose is going to show Hibas a different level uh, I don't think Hibas has made the adjustments or improvements necessary to fight at this level and Rose is going to show her that this is going to be a bit of a throwback performance in my opinion that is the undefeated post weigh-in show everybody do me a favor hit the like button jump in the comments down there let me know what your best bet for UFC Vegas 89 is good luck on all your degenerate action and of course let's rock